Compiègne is one of the largest and strongest cities in the country. North of Paris, its position is vital to whoever has its loyalty. For now, that loyalty belongs to King Charles, even though the king and his council had given the city up to the Duke of Burgundy as part of the truce. But Guillaume de Flavy, the captain of the city's garrison, refused the king's order. Capitaine de Flavy said that the city would remain loyal to the true king of France, truce or no truce. With more than 400 men in the garrison, no one wanted to force the issue in combat. The Maiden and her army march on to the town of Lagny and defeat a band of Burgundians there. Jeanne, tell us about Lagny. An incident took place there regarding a child. Yes, the child was three days old and declared dead. The maidens of the town carried the baby to place on the altar before the image of Our Lady of Lagny. I had gone there to pray. The child was as black as my coat, and no life was in it. What did the maidens want? For the baby to live long enough to be baptised, so it could be buried in holy ground. You prayed? All of us prayed. The child yawned three times, and the colour returned to its skin. It was baptised quickly, whereupon it died again. The maidens were grateful, for it could be buried as a Christian. From Lagny, Jeanne's army marches north, determined to rout the forces of the Duke of Burgundy and protect Compiègne. By this time, the Duke of Burgundy and his forces are 24 kilometers north at Noyon. Upon reaching Compiègne, Jeanne is given a banquet in her honor by Capitaine de Flavy. <laughs> to the maiden, sent by God to save France. Que Dieu bénisse son âme pour l'éternité. <laughs> The Duke of Burgundy launches a successful attack on choisy au a fortified bridge east of Compiègne, thus controlling that section of the river. Jeanne, the Archbishop of Reims, and the Count of Vendôme, Capitaine Louis de Bourbon, are without the means to attack. Jeanne, much as you dislike practicalities, I must tell you that we are out of funds and provisions for our soldiers. No town nearby is able to support an army of this size. The king cannot send us more men, nor the means to feed and equip them. We must retreat. What of Compiègne? Capitaine de Flavy has remained faithful to the king against all odds. Are we going to abandon him? He and his city are in God's hands. Why do we always say that when we fail to stay true to his mission? Be careful, child. Not all that you do is part of your mission simply because you do it. Have your voices given you clear instructions about this? I am not comfortable answering your question. Hmm. I thought not. Goodbye, Jeanne. You are dismissed. Au revoir, Eminence. I do not believe we will meet again. No? Well then... Farewell, maiden. The French forces withdraw. The Duke of Burgundy, with 4,000 men, attacks Compiègne. No, no, no. Uh, uh, how am I supposed to remain here in the safety of Crepy while Compiègne is attacked? Roussel, you have no choice. You say that because you are my squire. Capitaine de Zantray, you have come far to join us. Tell me what to do. Your squire is not wrong, maiden. Our choices are limited. The English and Burgundian forces have captured towns and villages all around Compiègne. The Duke of Burgundy has 4,000 men. You have how many? 400. 400. Loaves and fishes, good Capitaine. We have but four and God will provide more than enough to help our friends. Let us enter Compiègne under the cover of darkness, and God will direct us from there. You wish to travel tonight? Tonight. The 23rd of May. Jeanne and her troops hide in a forest south of Compiègne. 
With her squire, Jean Dolon, and Capitaine de Zantraille, she sneaks into the city to consult with Capitaine de Flavie. Valiant maiden, you have come back. I promised you I would, my good Capitaine de Flavie. Capitaine de Zantraille, it's good to see you again. And you, Capitaine. My good lords, my desire is to fight the English and the traitors of France later this very day. You are brave, dear maiden, but they have grown in number since you departed. We do not know how many they are or where they are encamped. My scouts tell me they are scattered in the towns all around us. It is good military strategy. It forces us to spread out, diminishing our strength. That would be true if we were one great force. We are not. Our small company can attack one town at a time. Who is here to help us? Capitaine Barthélemy Barretta has recently arrived with a small company of men. Call the commanders together, my lord. Good soldiers of France, Capitaine de Zantraille will explain our options. My lords, if you will look at the map. The Burgundians are across the bridge of the city to the north side of the River Oise. There are meadowlands which stretch some three quarters of a mile and rise beyond the slope of Picardy. The meadow is low and often flooded. <laughs> we remember well what low, wet meadows have done to our armies in the past. Thank you, Capitaine Barretta. <laughs> Now, the road to the town of Magny goes off to the west, following the steep slope of the hill. The enemy in Magny is commanded by Capitaine Baudot de Noyel. Further north, in Clairois, is the commander John of Luxembourg and his Picard. Uh, to the south, in Vernet, we have Sir John Montgomery. The Duke of Burgundy himself is now only two miles to the rear in the fortress of Coudin. Today, we will attack at Magny. The enemy has had no time to build strongholds. It will be easily taken. We may then make it our outpost. Capitaine de Zantraille, what if the enemy comes around from the north and cuts us off from the bridge back into the city? Capitaine de Flavy? I will post archers on the city walls to repel any who attempt to block the bridge. I will also place covered boats on the river. The soldiers may use those to retreat. <laughs> there will be no need to retreat. Even so, Capitaine Barretta. They will be there. You will attack tomorrow morning? This afternoon, my good Capitaine, because they will be expecting us in the morning. Mm -hmm. Taking Marny this afternoon will allow us time to fortify it as our outpost before they attempt to take it back tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Well then, may God be with us this day. The afternoon of May the 23rd. Jeanne's army of 600 men is assembled. The maiden wears a new set of armor, still her traditional white, but now covered with a vest of rich gold. Her standard bearer raises her banner. Her squire, Jean Dolon, on a brown steed, rides next to the maiden. At five o'clock, Jeanne leads her army out of the bridge gate and across the narrow drawbridge to attack Capitaine de Noyel and his troops near Mangy. Jeanne goes, knowing from her voices that she is unlikely to return. Jeanne, did your voices order you to make an attack from Compiègne? I had no order to go forth, but I thought with every battle that I would be captured. If your voices had ordered you to make the attack and had said that you would be captured, would you have gone? Not willingly. But I would have gone anyway, doing whatever they commanded, no matter what. The French army crosses the meadow, catching the Burgundians by surprise. The fighting is fierce. Twice, Jeanne's soldiers drive Capitaine de Noyel back to his camp. It seems as if the battle plan will succeed. But unbeknownst to Jeanne, John of Luxembourg and his knights have arrived simply to scout the area. Seeing the fighting, Luxembourg sends back an alarm for reinforcements from Clairroix. Word of the battle also reaches the English forces in Vernet. They rush to the fray. What was a skirmish becomes a major battle. Jeanne's men see the horde of enemy soldiers coming their way and panic. They scramble to the bridge and the boats in the river. 
Many lose their footing and fall into the water, sinking to their deaths. Jeanne will not give up the field, encouraging her soldiers to fight. No! No, stay! Do not retreat! You must stay and fight! Fight! But she is soon alone. Fight! The English have blocked her from the drawbridge back to the city. She is surrounded in the middle of the field. Capitaine de Flavy watches helplessly from the city wall. He cannot command his archers to let fly their arrows for fear of striking the retreating French soldiers. As the enemy comes closer to the drawbridge, he commands... Raise the drawbridge! Raise it now! Jean Delon, you were at Compiègne. I was, yes. I'm grieved to say it. No one sounded the trumpets, you know. Our men were not ordered to retreat. Captain de Flavy raised the drawbridge, trapping Jeanne and a handful of soldiers on the field. I was separated from her, fighting too far away to protect her. The Burgundians circled like wolves. One man, an archer, I think, reached up and caught hold of her vest, no. No. pulling her from her horse. No. Then a Burgundian lord, Lionel de Wandom, came forward, and as he was a nobleman, demanded her surrender. Jeanne was captured. I too was taken along with her brother Pierre and a few other commanders. I was told later that 400 of our soldiers were killed. Many of us wept. We wondered what would become of France without Jeanne. You are the maiden. You are John of Luxembourg. I give you welcome to Clairroy, and thank you for the joy you have given us this day. Joy, my lord? Great joy, because of your capture. Will you give me your word, in good faith, that you surrender and will not attempt an escape? I have sworn and given faith to someone other than you, and I will keep that oath. You make your life all the more difficult, then. Has the king been told of my capture? Am I to be ransomed? What king? Oh, your Dauphin. No doubt he knows by now. He will send his army to rescue those you have taken. Perhaps he will try. You will not be here, however. We will take you to my home at beaulieu les fontaines Then we will decide what to do with you. But first, my lord, the Duke of Burgundy wants to see you. Hmm. Is the Duke not afraid of me? I may put a witch's spell on him. Witch? <laughs> I see no witch here. I see only a poor, pathetic, peasant girl. Jeanne of Dom Rémy. My lord traitor. You are bold for a prisoner. Or perhaps you do not feel the need to hold your tongue, since you know you will be executed. You are so certain of that? Oh, yes. You will burn for your heresy. There will be a trial, of course, but you will burn. The English will tolerate no other outcome. And you are always ready to please the English. Ah, as it suits me. What is the need of a trial, then? To expose you for what you are. I, for myself, do not think of you as a heretic, but more as a feeble-minded creature that stupidly served a murderous prince. He used you, child. Any hope you have of his ransoming or rescuing you is in vain. My hope is not in him, but in my Lord Jesus. Ah. Then I am certain you will welcome the punishment he will give you through us. Your ignorance is no excuse for your sins of pride, vanity, and willful murder. You killed many of my friends. Perhaps you should have chosen your friends more wisely. 
I am not the one in prison. Is there a true priest here, to whom I may offer my confession? Oh, we shall see. It may please you to know that there are bishops who cannot wait to get their hands on you. My friend the Bishop of Beauvais, Pierre Cochon, is one. Not to offer you the sacraments, of course. Oh, no. He has questions. Many, many questions. If I do not answer? Then you make what is left of your life more difficult. Farewell, Jeanne. May God have mercy on your soul, since no one else will. The 26th of May. The maiden, along with her brother Pierre and squire Jean Dolon, are taken from Clairroix to the fortress of beaulieu les fontaines While there, the maiden attempts to escape, squeezing between two planks of wood in the door of her cell. She hopes to free her brother and squire and lock the guards in the tower. The plot fails when she is discovered by a servant. The 6th of June. The Duke of Burgundy arrives with his wife, Isabel of Portugal. They arrange to meet the maiden at the Episcopal Palace in the nearby city of Noyon, hosted by the Bishop Jean de Mailly. Jeanne of Don Remy. May I introduce my wife, Isabel? My lady? What a pleasure it is to meet you, is it? Oh, yes. She insisted on meeting you, though I remain at a loss as to why. Do not be unkind, husband. There are many who would relish a meeting such as this. Tell me, child, are they treating you well? I am treated as well as can be expected in a fortress. My lord husband, surely there is a better place for her to stay. Surrounding her with soldiers is prudent. She has attempted to escape, as you know. And why not? I would do the same, as would you, my dearest, if you were forced to stay in such a dreadful place. There must be a more amenable abode. The castle of Beaurevoir? It is surrounded by delightful forests. There are, I believe, other women in residence there as guests of Sir John. They share your name, Jeanne. Yes, you must have company. Am I not to be tried? You will be, once we have decided who will acquire you. Acquire me? It is all so tedious. The English want you, of course, but it has become something of a tug of war. You are quite popular in your own way. I wish they would do quickly whatever it is they intend to do. Oh, be patient, girl. Your sentencing will come soon enough. Not so harsh, good husband. I was wondering, as I am so close to the cathedral, might I say my confession? Receive the Eucharist? Or a moment to pray there, if nothing else? I will ask the bishop. He will say yes, of course. How could he deny you such a thing? Now, I am so glad it is settled. What has been settled, kind Duchess? The matter of your living conditions. Has it been settled? Oui. My husband will move this poor girl from that dreadful fortress to the castle at Beaurevoir. It must be done. The 11th of July. The maiden is moved to the castle at Beaurevoir. She will be imprisoned in the tower there for four months. During that time, her brother and squire are ransomed and released. No ransom is asked or offered for Jeanne. She attempts another escape, this time by leaping from the tower, a fall of 60 feet into a dry moat. Guards find her and are surprised that she did not suffer death or even broken bones. Why did you leap from the tower at Beaurevoir? I had heard it said that the people of Compiègne, even down to the age of seven years old, were to be slain because they had helped me. I was distraught to think of the destruction of good people on my behalf. I preferred to die rather than to live with such a thing. I also heard that I was sold to the English. I would rather have died than to be put in their hands. Did your voices tell you to leap? Catherine told me every day I must not leap, 
and that God would help me, as he would also the people of Compiègne. This was an answer to my prayer, since I could not understand how God would allow the people there to die when they had been so faithful to him. I then said to Catherine that if they would be well, then I would like to be there to see them. She said, Without fail, you must accept what has been given to you, and you will not be delivered until you have been put into the hands of the English. How did you respond? I said I would rather die. You hoped to kill yourself when you leapt. I commended myself to God in leaping, believing that I would not be delivered to the English if I leapt. Your plan did not work. I was so hurt by the fall that I could neither eat nor drink for two days. St Catherine comforted me, but also rebuked me for leaping. She said I must confess and ask forgiveness of God for what I had done. Soon after I was healed. Did the women of the house care for you? We. Oui. The Lady of Luxembourg, Jeanne of Bar and Jeanne of Bethune. I would have done anything for them. Even dressed again in women's clothes. The Lady of Luxembourg appealed to her nephew, Sir John, not to hand me over to the English. I was told that the King of England paid £10,000 for me. You were then delivered to the English, and in turn, their representatives in the church. The 23rd of December. Jeanne the Maiden is taken to Rouen. Along the way, she is paraded through a dozen towns. She is vilified as a witch, a whore, and a traitor, regularly threatened with physical abuse and rape. In Rouen, she is to be tried for her crimes, idolatry, invocations of devils, and several other cases affecting the Christian faith and working as heresy against the Christian faith. The Bishop of Beauvais, Pierre Cochon, will serve as judge, though he has no jurisdiction in that diocese and must be given special license. Let me be clear, my Lord Vicar Lemaitre. The witch will be held in the castle tower, in irons, guarded at all times by five men-at-arms, two at the door, three inside the cell. Well, that is hardly customary, my Lord Bishop. A woman prisoner is to be kept with women to preserve her honour, with the temptations of male guards to abuse her. I do not care about that. The heretic could escape or be rescued. Well, she's not yet declared a heretic. She is a heretic. Worse, she is a sorceress in league with Satan. If you do not see that already, then it would be best for you to uh, avoid the trial. Avoid it? Well, I am the vicar of the Inquisition. It is my responsibility to attend. If you will not oblige me, then do not resist me. Understand the limits of your authority. Stay away. Or come and keep your mouth shut. Or perhaps you would prefer to stand trial yourself for being an advocate for this girl. Well, um, it is not my place to meddle in these affairs. Obviously, you have everything in hand. Oh, I do. This way, witch. Where are you taking me? To the tower. Must I be chained? Orders. Wait! Wait, please! Stop! What do you want? I am Father Jean Massieu. I have been commanded to escort the maiden to her cell. As have I. Maiden, I am sorry about the chains. They slow me down. That is the purpose of chains. No matter. This way. This is the castle of Beauvoir. The boy King of England lives here. Yes. His residence is just None over. of your business. Is that the chapel? The body of our Lord is there. Oui. May I go there sometime? I will inquire. You will not, priest. Monsieur, you speak above your authority. You were well beneath yours if you allow this witch to receive the body of the Lord Jesus. The King of England uses that chapel. Let us move on. How old is the King of England now? Eight years. Too many questions, witch. Now move. 
quickly. You will be held in the tower. I will escort you to and from the trial. It is the only time you will be permitted to leave the room. Does the room have windows? One. Very small. But it looks out to the fields. If you are able to stand on your toes to look. The bishop is concerned about your well-being that you may fall. Or jump. We know well about your attempted escapes. So the door to your cell has been fitted with three locks. And three keys kept by three different members of the court. You will be guarded at all times. Three guards will remain with you in your cell. In my cell? Will I be safe? Will she be safe? Captain? Enough talk. On to the cell. Oh, no. C'est pas vrai. This. This is where I am to live. It is. Straw. Is that large block of wood my bed? You can use it as a bed, I suppose, since you will be shackled to it. Aren't you? And the, and the chamber pot. Am I to use it in front of the soldiers? They will turn their backs, as I am sure they are noble fellows. Do not count on it. This is an atrocity! It is better than she deserves. Sit, my good men, sit. <sighs> I am Bishop Cochon, the judge of this trial. We know you well, Eminos. And do you know one another? Our ecclesiastical notary, Guillaume Monchamp. Eminos? Will serve as court scribe, diligently recording all questions and answers. My good friend, Jean Le Fontaine, will serve as our examiner, asking what questions are needed to prove her guilt. I am eager to serve, Eminos. Um... Establish her guilt, my Lord Bishop, but not prove it. I will not quibble. Nicolas Loiseleur is a canon from the cathedral here in Rouen. Monsieur. Uh, to serve what purpose, Eminence? You ask many questions, Monchon. Perhaps I should have you question the girl. Forgive me, Eminence. I only wish to be clear about how we will proceed. We will proceed as is customary. First, the investigations and inquiries. Second, the trial itself. May I ask, my lord, how you were given permission to serve as judge outside of your jurisdiction? I worked hard to secure the peasant girl from the Burgundians for the English. But does that not make you partial to the outcome, Eminence? How can you judge fairly? Monsieur, are you questioning my ability to conduct this trial? I only wish to understand why there are so many irregularities. I will not be a part no of... No one will ask you to compromise your integrity, Monchon. Do not be concerned. But I am concerned, my lord. <sighs> Only today I learned that the investigators sent to Don Remy returned with a declaration that the girl is without fault regarding witchcraft or anything unholy, yet their assessment has been suppressed. I know nothing of that. And you would do well to keep your attention on your work at the trial and forget gossip and innuendo. You may go now. Eminence? I wish to speak to these gentlemen about their work. Au revoir, Monchon. Yes, my lord. Good day. Imbécile. Why not replace him? The court records must be impeccable. And he is the one to do it. I will manage him. Now, my trusted friend, Loiseleur. Yes, my lord. I have an important task for you. Father Jean. Good morning, Jeanne. Have you come to hear my confession? You have been promising. I have not been allowed since my arrival. Uh, perhaps my lord canon will permit it. Who? I am Nicolas Loiseleur, good maiden. Guards, leave us. Merci, Father Jean. You may go as well. Oh? Huh? Uh, oui, monsieur. Sit down, dear girl. I'm a canon at the cathedral. 
I've been asked to see to your spiritual needs. And I am from Lorraine. Are you? I've been to Dahomey. I'm also in sympathy with King Charles and all that you have done for him, but let us say no more about that. We must be very careful. Trust no one. Say nothing to the guards, even to Father Jean. To trust anyone, anyone, will lead to your destruction. I alone will hear your confession. I alone must be your confidant. I am grateful, my lord. Now, tell me all that weighs upon your heart.